I think if you're starting to show any signs of anxiety and depression that you did not show before, it's probably time to step away from the true crime documentary for a little bit. Welcome to the Persistence You podcast with Lizbeth. That's you as in university, but we're really much more of a community here. Your host is Lizbeth Meredith. She's an author, speaker, and online teacher. Each week, she'll be delivering amazing stories from survivors and thrivers, all threaded together with a dose of persistence. We're so glad you're listening. For sisters and brothers, I'm so incredibly excited to introduce to you Renee Williams today. Renee is the direct executive director of the National Center for Victims of Crime, and I am just so honored I get to meet her in person, hopefully, at the upcoming Crime Con in Nashville. But as someone who's worked as a survivor with survivors for more than three decades, I am so honored because I, I, we were just talking before we started taping, and if you mention victims, you mention survivors in your true crime job or in your job in criminal justice, your coworkers sometimes roll their eyes. Oh, so it's so important, this work. And I'm just so thankful that you are here, Renee, to speak to us today. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And Renee, can you tell us just a teeny bit about how the National Center for Victims of Crime began before we get into how you intersected with them. Sure. So I always like to tell this story in the true crime community because we really were started by one of the, the the families involved in one of the first true crime stories that took America by storm, and that was the Sonny Bombiolo case. Sonny was a very wealthy, very beautiful heiress who was killed by her second husband. She, she was actually put into a coma for 20 years because her husband at the time tried to overdose her with insulin. And her family, her children specifically, were just so appalled by how they were treated by the justice system that they founded our center because at the time, victims' rights weren't really a thing. And so they wanted to make sure that no victims were treated as they were. I love that. And that became a very famous movie with Jeremy Irons, who I still look at today as a killer, even though he was just doing a great job acting. Well, and it's interesting because in the movie, I think they did a great job of not of, of showing him as the potential killer, whereas the book, was, which was written by Alan Dershowitz, of course, and who was his attorney, the book, if you read it, really makes it seem like he did nothing wrong. <laughs> Surprise. Yes, mm-hmm. But I thought the movie producers did a nice job of, of taking some of that victim blaming out and making it seem a little more like the murder that it was. And wasn't it Glenn Close and Jeremy Irons? What was the movie? Do you remember the name? A reversal of fortune. That's it. Okay. It's a gold movie, so I always forget. But yes, okay. Everyone? Yes, and Jeremy Irons won his first Academy for that. I don't know if he won his second Academy, but he at least got his first one for that. He's absolutely amazing. Such a great actor. But anyway, what a beautiful extension of, like, they went through something really, really awful, and they turned it around and created an opportunity for people in the future. Mm-hmm. So that's fantastic. And I think our justice systems in general are, and, and true crime, we're becoming a little more responsive over time. We need to keep doing it. Yeah. How did you get involved in the job that you have now? Can you tell us about that? And like, what's the story behind this story? Well, the, the professional story is that I was asked to lead a bar association, which is one of our departments, and then became the ED when our ED left. The, the personal story, I think a lot of folks that work in victim services have a personal story. And it was that my family was extremely traumatized in a multitude of different ways. We talk about poly victimization a lot, and that certainly happened within my family both before I was born and then when I was growing up. So I had the opportunity to see how victimization impacts generations. Mm-hmm. And, and I wanted to, to get into this work to, to do my part to start stop, stop some of the cycle. Right. I love that. That's wonderful. And you, and one of the neat things about working in that field is you meet so many people passionate about creating change for future uh, generations. So that's excellent. Now, what do you do working with crime victims and survivors? In other words, what does your whole organization do? And I, yeah. So NCBC has a lot of arms. We've stayed 
working, we call ourselves generalists. So there's been a lot of organizations that have sprung up that have become specialists in human trafficking, specialists in domestic violence, sexual assault. We've remained generalists, and that's in order to address the core of victims' needs whenever a crime has happened. So what we see is, whether it's fraud, whether it's a financial crime, whether it's a violent crime, most victims will have a certain reaction. And so we try to address those certain reactions um, and have services for that. So we have a victim hotline. Any victim of any crime type can call us. We're going 24-7 in June, I believe. Oh, wow. We'll, we'll be 24-7 right now. We're, we're business hours only, and it's business hours on the East Coast. But any crime victim can call in. It is completely anonymous, and we will offer support, services, and referrals. We also have a D.C. specific hotline. And then we have a, a whole group that trains and they train police officers, victim advocates, judges, attorneys, anybody that has contact with a victim throughout the justice system. We're training them on best practices and on how to be victim centered. We have a big national conference that discusses best practices and victim services. And then we have a bar association and the bar association trains attorneys who practice civil law and help victims bring lawsuits. So we've, we've really cut hands everywhere. Wow, that is huge. That's mm -hmm. really huge. But congratulations on going 24-7 and congratulations to all of us because that's a way that we could say, here is a place that you can call if they can't help you directly, they'll know who can. And it's been, it's been a long time coming, but we're, we're thrilled to be doing it. That is not a small feat. So congratulations. But there were some great grant writers behind that. <laughs> there really were. Yeah. Okay. Now, I have worked, I mean, in a number of jobs with a lot of survivors who will say, my, you know, this thing happened five years ago. They happened, it happened 10 years ago, 30 years ago. I never availed myself of services or I didn't know that there were any. Do you have advice for people like that? Where would be a good place to send them? Because I, I'm concerned that they just are out there ready finally with nothing to support them. Yeah, I think if you're speaking for just general support, and, and this is not an ad, but it is because yes. we are free, you could call Victim Connect, which is our hotline, or go on victimconnect.org. We provide services to anybody whenever. Unfortunately, for some you know, the legal system's tough. So some folks might not be able to seek justice depending on their state, depending on what what the harm done was. And so in some cases, they will have to look outside of the justice system right. for justice. But it is never too late to get services such as therapy to start to to do a lot of writing, to write victim impact statements for themselves and say it. We have one attorney who... 40 years later, now she's an incredible woman. She is a very powerful woman. But 40 years later, she started an incredible website that named her perpetrator and is helping other women name their perpetrators. And she is paying all of the insurance costs for any defamation suit. And so she's launched that. So, so and this was 40 years later because she didn't get justice at the time. So wow. there, are, there are lots of options. It's never too late to get support services. Unfortunately, sometimes it's too late to hold somebody legally accountable. But I love what you say about it. It's never, as long as we're living, it's never too late to unpack some of that trauma in mm -hmm. one way or another. And if they don't qualify, let's say, for money for therapy, there are other therapeutic interventions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like what you were talking about, that website, that's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. oh, she person really is able to do this and it can be really and i have found it myself very therapeutic to write things out that have occurred the person is feeling like that's what they want to do i don't mean that they should be forced to do it but that's wonderful that's a really excellent that's an excellent bit of advice why is it important all of us that we whether we've been directly impacted by crime or not that we care about it I think when you never know when you will be impacted. There is a wonderful poem that came out of the Holocaust. And by wonderful, I mean devastating. You know. But it was, I didn't object when they came for this person because I was not this. And, and I, it goes through a litany of, right. of 
individuals who have been persecuted. And then the final line is, and when they came for me, there was no one to speak up for me. And so I think we never know what position we're going to be in, one. But then, two, just basic human dignity um, and compassion call for us to care about what happens to victims in the justice system. I like that. Okay. That makes total sense. I think part of our fascination about true crime, as an example, a lot of people will feel like that's them, that will never be me, and it's kind of fun to watch a car wreck. And other people feel opposite, like, I'm going to watch this, and oh my gosh, this could be me just as much as anyone else. Tell me about your work in true crime and making sure that survivors' voices are adequately and respectfully included. Well, I think you're right. I think true crimes become an interesting phenomenon. We've always been fascinated by true True. crime, right? I mean, you go back, Jack the Ripper was a sensation. That's not new. What's new is our ability to really consume it and to consume it at such a degree that it's 24-7. And so... I think folks' fascination with it is we like horror stories. We like the adrenaline rush. But what concerns me is that we're no longer viewing the victims as as humans. We're viewing them as characters. And, and we're allowing kind of a veil to come between ourselves and them. And so we've really tried to peel back at NCBC some of those layers. We've done a lot of work in the true crime space. One has been just putting out rules for for true crime fanatics, as they like to call themselves, and reminding people that timeline does not have a trauma. A lot of what we're seeing with this with this fascination and this increase of true crime are people getting involved in investigation. And everybody gets lucky. You know, the don't F with cats people, they got lucky. But most of the time, folks are just interfering with investigation and really causing further harm. Right. And the other thing I worry about is that you can't watch 24-7 true crime, you can't be as involved as some of these folks are and not start to feel vicarious trauma. And so in my world, we do a ton of work on vicarious trauma because we're hearing the worst of the worst every day. And it's not as entertainment, it's part of our job. And so we know how to address it. We know how to look at it. But your average consumer of true crime isn't going to know that. So they might not recognize signs of when they're starting to slide into a depression due to overconsumption of true crime and, and situations like that. Such a good point. Do you have any, want to share a few of the signs? Because I feel like, I know personally, I'll go through fifth, you know, binge time where I will just be fascinated by a, one documentary, then go to the next, the next. I'll have other times where I'm very intentional about making sure I have a healthy diet if I'm watching or listening to shows. And I think this is really important. It's easy to get sucked in. Oh, my gosh, yes. But I think if you're starting to show any signs of anxiety and depression that you did not show before, it's probably time to step away from the true crime documentary for a little bit. I will tell you my personal example. Before I was in this job, when I was a very young lawyer, I was watching ID Discovery for seven hours. You know, I'd get home and that's and I'd fall asleep to it. Right. And my mom came to my apartment at the time and I had laundry everywhere. And she was like, I think you're probably depressed. And I mean, it was. And part of that was my job at the time because being a young lawyer is tough. But but I wasn't helping myself by going home and watching what she called my murder shows. And it's good that you have someone to point that out because we mm-hmm. don't all. And that's mm-hmm. a big point. And I'm working in the field. My, I think sometimes you have to steal yourself and not take in every person's story so personally. But the danger with that is then you listen to people and you're thinking of them as a story or as a key or something to that impact. And they're not stories and they're not cases. They're humans that may have intersected and been, a, you know, unwillingly a part of your case if you're working in the field. And that's a difficult thing, too, is we, we have to protect ourselves. But in doing so, that becomes part of the problem if we're not careful. Well, and I think, too, like what you said, we also forget that these individuals are not public figures. They have been victims of crime. And so if they put their story out there to help solve the crime or to make their loved one no, that does not mean they are public figures. And not that public figures don't deserve privacy. They do. 
with these individuals did not have to become celebrities and to have a spotlight shine quite so brightly on them. So when they fumble in interviews, when they look exhausted, when they ask to be left alone, we have to respect that. And so often nobody does. And then you start to see the internet light up with theories and, and really just dragging these individuals that have probably experienced the worst trauma of their life. And it's important to remember that. I feel like, you know, but everyone wants to be able to give an opportunity, I feel like, for someone to have their voice heard, but it comes with so many unintended consequences. And so I think it's great that you're really focusing on some of the better practices for people working in the field. What are a couple of suggestions you might give for any of us who are First of all, working in the field with true, true crime to make sure that it's respectful and boundary appropriate. Make sure you talk to the victims first and do not assume you know how the victims feel. Understand that we, we've been saying, and I think it's a nice little catchphrase, but there's a lot more to it. There is no timeline for trauma. So we had a story of a woman who saw pretty violent photos of her mother's death from the 1980s advertised on a TV show. And she'd never seen those. And I think the makers uh-huh. of that show thought, well, it was in the 80s. That was 40 years ago. It, it doesn't matter how long ago it was. Anything can trigger you at any time. So, so know that and respect that. Always be honest about what you can and cannot do and be transparent. So we tell this to reporters. If something can't be off the record, you need to say that. If you can't stop a story, if you can't do something, tell the victim that so that they have conscious choice of what they are sharing with you. I like that. And for those of us guilty, maybe, but not guilty, but those of us who do watch true crime or who who look forward to it, and frankly, sometimes there are incredible stories of resilience inside them, what are some of the things that we can do with our angst after we, you, we're we finished? You know, what are ways that we can make a positive difference in the world outside of just shutting the TV off and going on with laundry? Well, I think the first thing is not even when you shut the TV off. If you see a true crime documentary that or it's pro, it's more with punk than maybe documentaries, but make sure you're telling the creator that you did not like that. Make sure that you are doing the reviews on Apple Podcasts and giving the one star and writing the reason you gave the one star. I mean, we have such economic power as true crime consumers to start to turn the tide. Netflix is making horrible movies. And it's because everybody is eating them up and nobody is saying, whoa, stop. Like, this is not well done. Nobody. And so they're going to keep producing it because there's a market for it. So so stop giving the market to bad productions. Um, and by bad, I mean not balanced with survivor story. It's not. I mean? Yes. I, I will tell you the Jeffrey Dahmer movie that came out a year ago didn't involve any of the victim's family. Not one. Not one. And they were then subjected to seeing that. So, so there's a lot of power in consumers that I think we don't realize. But then also, you know, Go volunteer at a shelter. We take volunteers for our hotlines every day. Do grounding exercises. Obviously, do grounding exercises. Be checking in with a therapist. There, there's lots of options. And make a donation of money if you don't. Absolutely, have- absolutely. Every every victim's nonprofit is constantly struggling for money. We. We've got a whole lot of people that we have to help. And even those of us who are well-funded are not well-funded enough. So if there's a domestic violence shelter, if, if there's a favorite nonprofit you have, make, make donations. I love that. That's fantastic. And I think to your point also about leaving reviews, if someone's done a really good documentary or a podcast, by all means, say why you like that. And, you know, if the survivor's voice really hit you in a positive way, absolutely let it be known and share it. There is a lot of power that we have. I don't think we we always remember that, but we have a lot of power to make a positive difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's so exciting. Well, what what is coming up next for your agency that is new and exciting in your world? And tell me about True Crime Con, uh, Crime Con a little bit. 
Well, yes. So we've got CrimeCon coming up and CrimeCon is, oh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a con for true crime aficionados. We're going to have two different sessions as NCDC. One will be interviewing Carrie Rawson and her experience with the true crime world and, and navigating that. And Carrie's father is BTK, the serial killer. And then we will be having a session with um, Tara Petito and Nicole Schmidt, who are Gabby Petito's mom and stepmom, and Mo Silva and Jane Sandler and Carrie, who will be giving their victim impact statement. And we'll have a booth at CrimeCon. And then we've got a lot of conferences coming up. So NCVC really, again, does make sure that we are helping all victims of all crimes. So we have a mass violence conference coming up that will take place in Pittsburgh. And that is looking at community resiliency following a mass violence event. We have a Justice Reform Summit coming up in Chicago in July, and that is bringing victim advocates together with reform advocates to discuss where we agree and where we disagree and how we can move forward to create a safer justice system. And then we have our big training institute in September in Portland. And that is a four-day extravaganza of any type of victim services you can imagine. That is a lot, and that's fantastic. And if you mentioned before, and we mentioned it on record, you're going to be able to have 24-7 staffing at the hotline, correct? Yes. Very soon, yes. So that's coming up in some months. And so for people who don't, you know, who don't think that they have any hope or anyone to talk to or to triage where they best be served if they're a survivor of crime, there mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. That is so wonderful. I can't thank you enough for your time. Where can people learn more about and maybe even donate to your agency? Sure, you can go to victimsofcrime.org. And if somebody needs the assistance, it's victimconnect.org. Okay. Thank you right. so much for your time. I cannot thank you enough, Renee Williams. I really appreciate it. I look forward to meeting you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Did we not? No, I definitely got a message that said we were recording. I did too. When did it cut off? Oh. When? Can you tell? I can't tell. It's recording now, but I definitely got a message that said it was recording. And we ha I know we have to hang up for you to be able to start to download it. Okay. Okay. I am so sorry. No, you're fine. And it is recording. completely okay if we have to We were recording. Again. We were recording. Let me... I will text you or email you. Yeah. If we have to do it again, that's fine. Next next Monday? Yes. I would love that. And I'm so sorry. I hope that we... I, I've never had that happen yet. But no, no worry. All right. Well, I so love meeting you. And let You're me just... Well. Yeah. You have a great day. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Okay. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. Thank you so much for listening. Now to find out more, head on over to lameredith.com and be sure to hop on the mailing list too. If you've enjoyed this show, please leave a rating and review or share with a friend. And if you really, really liked it, go ahead and subscribe so that you never miss another episode. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of Persistence You with Lizbeth. <laughs>